Psalm chapter 24. The earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. The world and all its people belong to him. He built it on the waters. He set it on the rivers. Who may go up on the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy temple? Only those with clean hands and pure hearts. Though they must not worship idols, they must not have made promises in the name of a false god. It is they who will receive a blessing from the Lord. The God who saves them will declare them right. Then they try to follow God. They look to the God of Jacob for help. Gates open all the way. Open wide aged doors. Then the glorious king will come in. Who is this glorious king? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord the powerful warrior. Gates open all the way. Open wide aged doors. Then the glorious king will come in. Who is this glorious king? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the glorious king. Thank you. That's good. That's good. What do you think? Do I win the Harrison Ford look-alike contest? <laughs> uh, uh. You know, last week I, I began talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and I had three people come up and mention Indiana Jones. Now, I'm so culturally pop that, uh, is, that do, is that even how you say that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that it's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. So I decided I would be Indiana Jones today. <laughs> now, do you know that in 1981, um, Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark came out, and that was the highest grossing movie of that year. And it remains to be one of the biggest classics ever, um, it's considered one of the top 100 movies of all time. And I stop and I think about that. And I think, well, what is it that made that so popular? Why did everybody um, look at that? And, and, and by the way, the way I understand it, like even the Star Wars stuff kind of came from that. Well, number one, Steven Spielberg. He's a good director. Um, they had great music in it. They had exotic travel they had romance, they, they had this sense of power, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. The plot is that we don't know really where the Ark of the Covenant is. Do you know that more than one um, country claims to have the Ark of the Covenant today, but nobody's showing it? <laughs> I don't know. Anyhow, it is, it, it's, you know, whatever happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the plot of Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, is that the Nazis were wanting to find it because they believed whoever has the Ark of the Covenant will be invincible. That's the word they used, invincible. Well, as you know, based on last week, the Ark of the Covenant, or there was power there, but the power was from God, not from using the ark as a lucky charm, okay? But nevertheless, we, we really have this thing about power, um, strength, and that kind of thing. And, and so I believe that, that all of us having, wanting more power, wanting to have a sense that we're connected with something mysterious and, and magical or mis, uh, mystical, is, 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 is such a desirous thing. And really what we're looking for is God. We're looking for God's power. We're looking for, um, for, for this. Um, but um, I want to share with you that, that um, in the end, so, so you've got Indiana Jones representing America, and you've got the Nazis, and they're looking for the Ark. Well, in the end, Indiana Jones finds the Ark. But 
but it's swept off by his country, um, America. And then it's like, hey, where's the ark? What happened to the ark? And, and um, here's what it says. Um, the, the next line after he says, where is it? It, um, um, it says, it's somewhere very safe. And then he says, it says, the ark is the source of unspeakable power. It has to be researched. And um, so, so I, want to, I want to alter that a little bit. The ark isn't the source of this power. And it doesn't have to be researched. I want to say that God is the source of this power. The ark only points us to or represents him. And God doesn't need to be researched. God's power, God's presence needs to be experienced. That's the difference between the world and we believers is all this power that God has for us is for our good and it needs to be experienced. So last week we talked about the power of the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, it might be a week late, but you'll notice that I actually came up with a, a worksheet. Did you see that? And, and by the way, yes, thanks. Um, uh, this is the tabernacle. And notice the tabernacle. You've got the outside where the community gathers. You've got the holy place where only the priests can go and do their priestly duties. And then you've got the holy of holies. And that is reserved only for the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was to be. And indeed, during the wandering of those 40 years in the desert, that's where the Ark was when they were not traveling. Now, when they traveled, they had this, this uh, like lid or or thing to shield it, and, and they had special ways to move the Ark of the Covenant, along with all the other curtains and all the other poles and all the other pieces, because it was portable. And they would go from place to place, and um, wherever they stopped for camp, the, uh, in the center of the people would be reassembled the... Um, the um, uh, the uh, tabernacle, and then there would be all surrounding them three tribes on each side, uh, um, so that so that God was always in the center of the community. Is the idea of that now this is a depiction of the Ark of the Covenant? Now, if you get online and you Google Ark of the Covenant, you'll have all kinds of versions of this. So it's not like it's not like Moses took a snapshot of the Ark of the Covenant and we have that. Yeah, yeah, a selfie. <laughs> Me with the Ark. Yeah, that's right. It's not like that. But I thought this was one of the most credible of them in everything. So that's what, that's what I did. And so, so uh, on that worksheet, you've got, you've got us in enemy, the Ark in enemy territory. You remember that what I talked about last week was when the Philistines, when the Jewish people used the ark as a rabbit's foot and they didn't really trust and they didn't really submit and they just thought, oh, we're desperate, so we'll just try this. It, it, God was not going to work for them. He didn't. And then the ark was taken by the Philistine people and they thought, victory, victory, we've got victory. And so they looked at the ark as representing one God among many, because, because the Jewish people believed in one God, the people around them, including the Philistines, had a belief that there are many gods, many of them are tribal, many of them only are gods of this or that. And so they placed the ark um, in the temple of Dagon. Dagon is, is one of the Philistine gods. And then and then the, the statue of Dagon kept falling over. And it actually broke. And so they like, oh, let's get rid of this. And no matter where they put the ark, there was calamity. And so you might remember from last week, the Philistines made a brand new cart. And they put the ark on the cart. And they had two oxen. 
And wherever the oxen went, that's where the cart went. I think they sent it in the direction of the Jewish people, however. So, so it comes, and that's where we're picking up today. The Ark of the Covenant comes to rest at Beth Shemeth. And in 1 Samuel chapter 6, you can read along and follow, follow this. You would think, okay, now the Ark is home where it belongs. The end of the story, this is all good, this is all wonderful. The people of God now have, have, the, have the Ark back in their presence. But do you know what? When, it, when they see the cart coming in and they see it gleaming in the sun with the Ark of the Covenant, they're, they're harvesting. And they stop harvesting and they look, whoa, it is the Ark of the Covenant. This is great. So, so they come and, and it set and it rests right next to a great big stone, it says in 1 Samuel. And so they come and they see it and, and they, they actually... Um, if I remember right, they took the wood from the cart and they made a sacrifice and everything. They were just filled with joy. But do you know what they did? They treated the ark as a curiosity. They were cavalier. It's like, oh, we've got this big icon here. Oh, I wonder what about it. And now, now some of the depictions of the ark has like a little shelf and, and in the shelf you've got uh, the Ten Commandments, and, you know, some of the other relics that are there. But some people believe it was more like a lid. Either way, the ark is holy. And it is to be revered as you revere the holiness of God. And instead... They came and they, oh, look at this. Oh, look under here. Oh, look, look. And 60 curiosity mongers died. And it's like, it's like, what? You're our God. The ark comes back to us. It's supposed to be a good thing. And yet, here we go again. Death associated with the ark. And I want you to know, God is powerful. God is a fierce God. God is willing to use his presence to favor us or to discipline us. But when we're casual or cavalier or simply curious about him, He's unwilling to be transformed into who we think he should be. We need to be the ones who see God, who he really is, holy and true. And we need to experience him rather than our version of him. And that is hard. It really is hard. And when, and, and, and it seems as if sometimes, God, what do you want? You're exacting. Do we have to be perfect? You know, what, can't we ever please you? Are you impossible to please God? So, so the people at Beth Shemeth, they didn't want God's presence because it seems as if God's presence was a, a condemnation to them they weren't doing this faith thing right. And so the next thing we see is that the, the ark is moved to the home of Abinadab in Kirath Jerim. And there, things are a little bit different. They actually had a person that they assigned, Eleazar, to be the person to kind of guard the ark, to make sure everything was good. And, and so they showed it a, a little more respect. Do you know, though, the ark was in that home for 20 years. It wasn't moved. It was like a hot potato. It was like, we are too afraid of you, God. You are fierce. You are hard to know what to do. We don't want to take the chance and, and, and move the ark at all. 
lest we do something wrong. And so here you've got this commanding chest, simply idle. Now during this time, in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 7, we have Samuel the priest and the prophet. He's, he's kind of the number one spiritual leader back then. And, and Samuel actually calls the people um, to Mizpah. And he says to the people, hey, it's time for change. We've got to realize that there's one God. And we're not going to change that God. God is all about changing us, our disposition, our attitude, our sense of loyalties. God is not going to be content with us having him and then adding little icons and little, little false gods and, uh, to, to our life. No, we have to choose. And he says, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, rid yourselves of foreign gods and commit yourselves to serve only him. And he will deliver you from the grip of the Philistines. And then it says, so the people of God returned to God. Samuel offered a lamb as a sacrifice and Samuel interceded for the people. So we have a sense of a, a national revival, renewal, where now the people turn to God. So time goes on and now David becomes the king. First, Saul became the king, and that didn't work out too well. And then David became king. And to be honest, it took seven years for David to be the king of, of, uh, of I, I think, Judah. And then another seven years before he became king of the entire nation. But anyhow, <clears throat> so now... David is the king, and, and as you know, David is like this wonderful king. David is like the hope of the nation. David has a heart for God. David really, really wants to have God be, to dwell among them, to be the centerpiece of the nation. And David moved the spiritual capital, um, I, it, it had been at Shiloh, and I'm not sure if that was the last place or not. But David established Jerusalem as the capital, both the national capital and the spiritual capital of the people of God. So David established that. And so now in Jerusalem, we have, we have the tabernacle set up. And and on the outside courts, you got the place for the sacrifices. And in the... Uh, in the holy of holies, or in the holy place, you've got the the different um, candlesticks and the different things that represent uh, different things that the priest does. But the holy of holies is empty. The ark of the covenant is not where it belongs in the holy of holies. Instead, it's still just waiting at the home of Abinadab. And so David, with great leadership, I believe, thinks it is time to move the Ark of the Covenant into the center of Jerusalem. Now you would think, and I would think, that God would be thrilled that David, King David, wants to put this Ark where it truly, truly belongs. So um, they get ready to do that. And David, with all zeal and enthusiasm and excitement, goes to the home of Abinadad. He puts the ark on a cart. That's what the Philistines had done. And there's oxen leading the cart. And there's like 30,000 of the nation's leaders who are proceeding like a parade with great, with great music, with great 
enthusiasm and energy, and they are going to bring the ark into the city of God, into Jerusalem. It's all wonderful. It's all powerful. And David is dancing, and they're going, and it's all great. But do you know what happens? The ark stumbles. And when the ark stumbles, Adamadad had two sons, Uzzah and Ahio. And, and they are like maybe on one side of the ark and the other side there, like we're going right with the ark. And the oxen stumble. And Uzzah did what most of us would do. In reflex, you don't want the ark to fall, so he tried to steady it. And instead of appreciation for that innocent act, it's like he was struck down by like lightning. And he fell over dead. And the music stopped, and the everybody looks, and there the ark again, the power, the fierceness of of this this God um, is misunderstood. And now they don't know what to do. And they're all afraid. And David is furious at God. God, we're trying to do something here. I'm trying to put you where you belong. And now, I don't know what to do. And David was furious. And so, they moved the ark. They, had, they couldn't just leave it there. They moved the ark to the house of Obed-Edom. And you can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And they, and they just like, what do we do? What do we do with this God? What does he want from us? Is he never satisfied? But do you know, it wasn't another 20 years. It was only three months. So something happened between David's flare-up of anger with God and his second attempt. Something happened. Now the Bible doesn't tell us a litany of that, but we can figure it out quite a bit. Do you know that during that three months that it was at the house of Obed-Edom, O Obed Edom's family was blessed and favored and they prospered. So so here David hears about that and so David has hope. And David is like going to seek the Lord. And David is saying, God, help me understand who you are. Help me reckon with your power. Help me to help me to do what you want done in the way you want done, when you want it done, so that your will and my will are the same. And so it only took three months, and David summoned up the courage to try again, to move the ark with all the pageantry of the first time again the second time. What I want you to notice is that the first time he was so excited that it was joyful and it was celebratory. The second time, it was not a funeral dirge. It was not solemn. It was not fearful. No, no. It was just as, if not more, celebratory than the first time. Okay? It really was. I think that's so important because when we read this story, we get the sense that God is to be feared and we are simply to be afraid that we're going to be struck down. But David got beyond that. David sees that God is so powerful. His power is to bless. His power is to discipline but, but, but what is most important is that instead of us trying to, to um, have God please us, 
if we will do the homework, if we will do the background, if we will do the research to see what does holiness look like? What, what does favor with God mean? And then we allow God to shape us and to discipline us and to, to help us to see life differently. Do you know Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And then it says that, that my thoughts are not God's thoughts. And God's thoughts are not my thoughts. My ways are not God's ways. God's ways are not my ways. So, so it is up to us to have a sense that God is not just like me. I made in his image. So we do have a way to relay and connect, but, but he's not just another bro. He, he's not just a neighbor. God is other. God is more. God, God is, 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 it's from him and through him and to him. He is, he is so everything. And, and you know what an anvil does? An anvil has to be more weighty, more hard, more, more strong than anything that is pounded on it. Because one thing is going to be shaped by the other. And I'm telling you, what this is all about is God will shape us. We will not shape God. Now, God is truly loving. God really wants our best. Just like a father disciplines a son. How do you like being a father or a teenager? Anybody? It's hard. People have to be shaped. They have to learn. And it's not easy and it's not comfortable. But, but you know, God wants to shape us into someone who also is holy and reflects his image. And that's what this story is all about. So here we have this second time. In David, there are some differences this time. In this three months, first of all, do you know what? The ark wasn't put on a cart. He didn't get his cues from what the neighboring Philistines did. He put the ark was carried on the shoulders of the priests, just like it was supposed to be when they carried it. Notice the difference? The priests carried the ark. Not an animal, not an intangible cart. The priests did. What a difference. Not only that, they took six steps and then they offered a sacrifice um, to God. It was a worship. It was, it was linking what they were doing with worship. Perhaps the first time David was thinking more as a king and less as a priest. More as a political leader, less as a spiritual leader. This next time, it says that David actually wore a linen ephod, which is, which is what the priests wear. Um, now, to be honest, I, and I don't have enough... This confuses me a little bit because King Saul was dethroned because he acted as a priest, taking the priest's authority when, because he was impatient. And here, David seems like he has the heart of God to look at himself not only as a king, but also as a priest. A priest brings people to God and God to people. They're the mediator. But somehow here... Maybe the attitude is very different, whatever. But David sees his spiritual role more than or in addition to his national role. And again, he, just like before, he danced before the Lord with all his might. And so that was no different. And um, then, can you imagine this? They come to Jerusalem the gates are open. They walk through the streets. The doors open. They come into the courtyard through the holy place. And then the four priests position the ark in the center of the holy of holies with the poles extended. And now, the people of God 
and the God of the people are one. And then David blessed the people of God. And David had sweet treats for everyone to take home to share. And that is the story. Now, Psalm 24 is where I started out last week. Psalm 24 has a lot in it. Even though it never once mentions the ark, we know that it is David's psalm. And when it says the earth is the Lord's and everyone who lives in it, what this is saying is God wasn't just the God of the Jewish people. Notice that God had power over the Philistines. We people of God have got to see that God isn't just concerned with what happens in our life. He's concerned with every human being coming under, um, realizing that they belong to God and that God can respond to them. So the Jews were challenged in David. And I think, I think what happened is during that three months, David learned these things in Psalm 24. And then it says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place or in the temple? That is, how do we come into God's presence? How do we do that? If God is this fearful God, is this reverent God, is this holy God, how do we approach him? And here's the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The person who does not lift their soul to an idol or they swear by what is false. God's holy character is to be reflected in our actions and in our dispositions, in our motives, in our attitudes. Um, God is teaching his people through the ark and the unfolding drama of the ark about himself. And commitment, not curiosity, and, and, and reverence toward God, not living, trembling, and knowing that God is one and the only God and there are no other imposters makes a difference. And David had to search. David had to research. David had to investigate. What has God told us about the care of the Ark of the Covenant, the placement of the Ark of the Covenant, and the movement of the Ark of the Covenant? And then he went out to please God by doing accordingly. And that's what happened the second time. And then it says that the person with clean hands and a pure heart will receive blessing and vindication from God. Finally, when David cared enough to discover how God expected the ark to be treated and what it truly represented, then he experienced blessing and vindication. First time, it, it didn't happen. He prayed, he sought. And the second time he made those changes and it happened. And then it says, this is so cool, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. David wanted to be the leader of his generation and he sought God. And when disaster struck Uzzah, David, as, even though he was furious with God, turned to God for guidance. And when David recognized that he was not seeking the ark, but he was seeking the king of glory, ah, what a difference. Let's be part of that generation who seeks God as he is. And then it says, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. This is probably how we, why we think of this as being all about the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem had, had gates. And, so, and I read somewhere, and I really, I really don't know, really don't know how um, viable this is, but that, but that uh, we know that you can close the gates, but I think of a gate as closing this way. But something I read said, that the gate was more like a roll-top desk, and so you lift it up to open it. Now, I don't really know 
I didn't take the time. I had too many details. I didn't really take the time to see if that was substantiated or not. But so when it says, lift up, it's like make a way for, open up your heart to God. And, and when the, and the doors open and the gates are lifted and the Ark of the Covenant comes into the outskirts of the city, it goes through the, the wall and through the gate and it, it goes down the street and it goes into the courtyard of the, of the tabernacle and into the holy place and into the holy of holies and is placed there. And so this is the visualization of the ark coming into the city and everybody welcoming the, the fearful, the real, the substantive presence of God. And David was anticipating joy of the dwelling of God once again being with the dwelling of man. And then he's called the king of glory. Now, and and the Lord is mighty and strong in battle. The maker of heaven and, or the maker of earth and the people of the earth are to look at God as mighty and capable and ready to do our fighting for us if we will recognize his glory. Now, I mentioned this last week. I didn't really dwell on it. The, The Hebrew word for glory means weighty. God has substance. God is significant. And when we treat him thus, and when we place him in the center of our lives, we experience the wonder of his glory. Now someone asked me after first service, about that. And, and I want to say also the word glory, as it is used in context, has to do with brilliance and radiance and, and that kind of thing. So, so it's not just weighty, but that's what the word means. And I'm telling you, when light comes into darkness, there's substance. And it shows what is. It shows what is real, and it shows what is false. And that's what God wants to do in our life. Now, God desires to be welcomed just as Jerusalem prepared for the coming of the ark and they welcomed him. God wants us to welcome him into the center of our being. And in that movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, at the end, Bodhi says, the ark is a source of unspeakable power. It has to be researched. Indiana Jones replied, they don't know what they've got there. And I would like to offer a slight reinterpretation. I want to talk to us and say God himself is the source of unspeakable power. He has to be experienced, not researched, experienced. And Jones's reply would be, anyone who does this will discover the treasure they've got with God there. So I want to invite you to the treasure of the significance of seeing God as he is and allowing him to transform our character in response. Lord, I thank you for your power, your might, and I ask that you help us to place you exactly where you need to be. Help us to be the son who is shaped by the father, the metal that is refined by fire on the anvil of your character. In Jesus' name, amen.